If you've got your Bibles, we'll be uh, looking at that passage we read in Philippians chapter 3. Now, as we begin, I just want to start by asking you, have you ever experienced that moment of sheer embarrassment when somebody who is much better than you tries to humble themselves? Now, you'll experience this in a range of different ways. The the one for me is when I go to somebody's for food and they prepare a three-course banquet. The food is cooked lovely and beautiful. It is perfection. And I sit there and I enjoy my food and then at the end of the meal, the person who prepared it will say, oh, I'm not much of a cook. (laughs) And you think, well, if you're not much of a cook, what does that make me? How terrible must that make my cooking? What we see here at the, uh, the beginning of the passage we're looking at is that Paul is looking and comparing himself to the beauty and the reality of Christ. Paul is looking at the, the wonder of the resurrection that is to come and Paul comes to this conclusion in verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Paul is admitting here that he's not perfect. The great missionary Paul, the apostle, the one whom Jesus himself appeared to at his conversion, the one who has established churches, this Paul is saying, I'm not there yet. I've not obtained it yet. I'm not perfect yet. I'm not there yet. I've still got more that I need to strive towards. Paul is saying that in his Christian life, he's not mastered it. He's not the expert. He's not perfect. He's not content or satisfied with his current state. Paul is going to press on. Paul is seeking to grow and develop in his spiritual walk. Paul is willing to put in the effort and the work to grow and to live for Jesus. Paul seems to be implying here that his heart's desire is to be more like Jesus. His heart's desire is to be complete and fulfilled in what God has called him to be. But he's not arrived yet. He's not in that point of perfection. He has not mastered the Christian journey. I meet a lot of people and they'll say, you know, oh, are you a practicing Christian? And they'll say, no, I've mastered it. I'm an expert Christian. Paul isn't deluded by any arrogance like that. Paul admits that he's not perfect, that he's not there yet. But through God working in him, his desire is not to stand still. His desire is not to tread water. He's not just happy or comfortable where he is. But Paul's desire is to press on in his faith. To keep on going. And there's a a lot of sports analogies that uh, are littered throughout this passage. As Paul is pressing on in his faith. He is striving to be more like his saviour, Jesus. And so why is Paul going to press on? That's the big question. Paul has said, I'm not perfect, I'm not there yet, I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to press on, which is a word that exhibits uh, exhilarance and effort and work. Paul is going to work in his spiritual life. Paul is going to not be passive in his walk with Jesus. But he's going to commit himself wholly to the gospel. But what is his motivation? Now every athlete needs a motivation, don't they? When you are putting your body under such pressure, when you are enduring such great uh, pain and effort, you need something in your mind to remind you, why am I doing it? Why am I putting myself through this? Well, what's Paul's motivation? I think Paul's motivation, 
The thing that is keeping him, the thing that will keep him through every struggle and trial, I think it's the end of verse 12. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. That is what Paul reminds himself. The reason why he continues to have an all-out pursuit for Jesus Christ is because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Paul's motivation is the triumphant work that Christ has done. Paul's motivation is the power and the blood of Jesus. Paul's motivation is not in himself or what he can do. It is in what Jesus has done for him. That Jesus has made Paul his own. He's brought Paul into the family of God. And Jesus endured such great sufferings upon the cross. And only because Jesus died on that cross can I be counted as his own. Only because of what Jesus has done for us can we know as Christians, I am one of his people. And we're going to remember and uh, partake in communion later today. And it is that reminder, isn't it? That because of Christ's sacrifice, because of what Jesus Christ has given and done, because of that and only because of that, I'm his. I'm one of his own. We have a confidence as believers that Jesus Christ has made us his own. And that's Paul's motivation. That is what is in the, the front of his mind. Because life is hard and life is difficult. And as Paul continues to run this race, in the back of his mind is always this. What Christ has done. What Christ has given to me. How Christ has helped and supported me. How he has saved me. And so with that as the motivation, with that as his driving force, knowing that he is safe in Christ Jesus, Paul presses on. So the inevitable question is this. If we want to walk faithfully in our Christian journeys, if we want to advance as Christians, if we want to continue steadfastly in the faith, how do we press on? What does it mean for me in my Christian life, not just in church, but outside this building, in work and wherever we are, what is it to press on? Well, Paul says in verse 13, but one thing I do, and from this thing that Paul outlines as his goal and his focus, really I've pulled out three practical things that we can do. And so what I want us to do this morning is simply look at three things that will help us to press on with our faith. As we continue to live for Christ who died for us, these are three things that Paul identifies. And the three things we're going to be uh, really thinking about today are forgetting, straining, and pressing. This is what Paul outlines that we are to do as Christians. And all three of these are an illustration of running. They're all, if I could put it that way, verbs. They're doing words. They're things that we are called to do. My first point is forgetting what's behind. Verse 13, Paul says, But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. Now, forgetting what lies behind can often be a hard and difficult thing to do. But here is a reminder that instead of dwelling and being focused and being dictated to by the past, we are to look forward. We are to forget the past. Now, believe it or not, and some of you probably won't believe it, but when I was younger, I used to be a swimmer. And I was quite good at swimming. And I would compete in competitive races. And I'd be in the midst of a race, and, and backstroke was my preferred stroke because I got to lie down, and, uh, and I enjoyed that. And so I would be doing backstroke. I'd be lying down. I'd be putting my all into it because I wanted to win that race. I wanted to be the victor. And then as I was giving everything in that race, 
a little thought popped into my mind. A curious thought. And I wouldn't be able to get it out. And the thought was, how close are they to me? How, how far are they to me? And so what I'd do is I'd be lying down, I'd be going uh, as fast as I can, and then I'd lift my head up and I'd have a look round, and in that moment, they'd have overtaken me. That split second of looking backwards, cost, it cost me a lot of races, uh, much to my parents' uh, displeasure, I'm sure. But I could not help myself but look back. And as I looked back, my eyes were taken off while I was going off the finish line. And I'd lose. I'd forgotten where my goal was. I was so busy looking backwards that it cost me the race. And Paul makes it clear here that we are forg to forget what lies behind. Now, I want to make this very clear. Does this mean that we should not learn from our mistakes? The past is in the past. Ignore it, forget it. Don't bother learning from it. Move on with your lives. It's all forgiven. It's all dealt with. It's all good. I don't think that that is what Paul means by any stretch of the imagination. And my evidence for this is quite clearly, as we've seen in uh, Philippians, if you look at Philippians 3, verse 5 and 6, Paul uses his past as an example. Paul is using examples of his past, how he used to live, where his confidence used to be. He uses this as an example of how not to be, of how not to live. And so what Paul is talking about here is not this idea that we can never learn from our mistakes. What Paul is talking about here is that our past lives should not overwhelm us. They should not dominate us. They should not define who we are. They should not shape continually our Christian lives. We can often reflect back in our lives and and what do we tend to remember more than anything else? It's the mistakes. It's what we've done wrong. Where we have failed, where we have messed up, where we had a perfect opportunity to talk about Jesus and we spoke about sport instead. Or we, we shied away from it. Or we were too embarrassed to, to invite someone to church. So often when we reflect on the past, we remember our failures. The things that we have done wrong. The, and so often these things can stifle us in our Christian walk. So often we can be challenged to the point of view of, does God still love me after I've done this? Am I still forgiven? Am I still one of God's own? So often by reflecting back, it can have such a, a negative and damaging aspect. And what Paul says here is forget the past. Leave it in the past. We are not to be constantly looking back to our past failures, our past mistakes, because we know as believers that we are forgiven. We know that the blood of Jesus is enough to forgive us of our past mistakes, of our failures. They have been dealt with. And here we are not to hold on to it. We are not to, to beat ourselves up over our past mistakes. In many ways, I think Jesus is quicker to forgive us of our sins than sometimes we are to let go of them. But I also want to make a very important point in this idea of forgetting. Because sometimes when we look back, we try not to look at the negatives and we look at the positives. Oh, that was a good sermon I preached the other week. I forget the bad ones, but the good one I preached, that was really good. Oh, do you remember that week when I read the Bible every day for two years? That was a good two years. And sometimes I would even say that focusing and remembering past victories and past triumphs, I think that can be a mistake. If you're in the midst of the race and you're thinking, oh, remember when I won this race? That doesn't help you for the here and now. Sometimes it can stifle us. Sometimes we can almost remember so much of how good we've been, we can almost uh, venerate ourselves and think we are saintly. And we forget the need that in the present moment we need God. 
Be careful with how you treat and deal with the past. Be careful not to reflect too much on your, your own greatness or of what you have done or what you have achieved. But be reliant to God in the present. And there are many uh, Christians and non-Christians who their past is a barrier between them and God. What they have done wrong can be a barrier between them and God. And they will ask, can God ever forgive me of this? I love the hymn that says, When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. We, we know that experience, don't we? When we're sitting there and we're thinking, oh, I'm awful. Can God ever love me? Can God ever use me after what I have done, what I have continued to do? Can God ever use me? And as the hymn goes, up would I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. I'm not going to pretend like it's easy to move forward. It's easy to forget. But that's what we're called to do. We need to be, have that reminder that we are to forget what lies in the past. Why? Because we are moving forward to something that is greater. Please learn from your mistakes. Please learn from your failures. Please do not do it again. We see time and time again Paul emphasising that. But do not let past traumas, past difficulties, past things hold you back from where you are going. And that's my second point that we shouldn't be focusing on the past because instead we should be living in the present. And Paul goes a little bit further in verse 13. If you're not to be looking back, what are you to be doing? But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. My second point is straining forward. Instead of looking back, we are to strain forward. This is almost the complete opposite. Paul is saying, don't do this negative, do this positive. Instead of constantly harping back, look forward. Look forward to where we are going. And, and this can be quite difficult because I don't know the future. I don't know what is coming. I don't know what I am straining into. I don't know other translations have leaning into. I don't know what I'm leaning into. But I know that my God is with me. I know that my God controls the future. I know that I go with him. I know that I am not on my own. And with that in mind, we in our Christian lives should be straining forward. We shouldn't be passive we shouldn't be inactive as believers. Paul didn't know the future, but he leant into it with such confidence because he knew who his God was. Now, many of you will know what, uh, what straining is. When you drop something on the floor and your back is not as young as it used to be and you reach over to try and pick it off the floor and you, you just can't reach, you know what straining is, don't you? That is straining. You are putting a lot of effort in to reach the floor. It's hard work. There is effort. There is personal responsibility. Paul's motivation is that Christ has made him his own. Paul knows that he is saved and justified by what Christ has done, but he doesn't negate his own responsibility. And this morning, my... my uh, Encouragement and what I'm trying to spur you on to do is strain forward. In your Christian lives, in your Christian walk, keep on st straining, keep on trying, keep on working and moving. Reaching forward. It's almost like you are stretching out as far as your arm can go, as far as your fingertips can spread. You are so desperate to go and to reach and to follow Christ's example. Reach after him. In this sense, Paul is almost running after Jesus. 
He is spurred on and encouraged by Christ's example. And let me tell you this, if you are in a race, nothing motivates you more than seeing the person in front of you. When you're in a race and you're in second place and you can see the person in front of you, that's a great motivator, isn't it? You know where you're running. You know who you're chasing down. You know who you're following. Friends, in your Christian walk, follow him. Run after him. Chase and emulate Christ. Paul is not sitting back and waiting for God to move him. There's an action. There's an activity. He's working hard. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24 picks up on this uh, common theme throughout the Bible of it being a race. 1 Corinthians says, So run the race that you might obtain it. And the word run here, I don't know about you, but if I ever run, something is wrong. I don't run everywhere. I, I conserve my energy very well, thank you. If I'm running, then something has happened. If I'm running, then I am running for a reason. And Christians, we have a reason to run. We run after him. If I could put it this way, I might regret it, but we are to not be spiritual couch potatoes. Do you know what I mean by that? We are not to sit resting on our, on our laurels. We are not to sit not putting in any effort into our spiritual walk. Run. There's effort. Chase after Christ. There's nothing more. There's nothing that can compare to him. Run after him. We should challenge ourselves in our sanctification. In my life, am I living the way God would have me live? Am I putting off the old self? Athletes constantly, don't they, have to uh, almost subdue their bodies and push their bodies to the limit. They have to have control over themselves. Do we have control over ourselves? Do we have self-control? Are we resisting the flesh in order to reach out and hold on to Christ? How would you describe your, your prayer life or your Bible reading? Are you having a, a mild, sort of gentle uh, peruse to the scriptures? Or are you running? There is a, an emphasis here that in our Christian life, oh, we are on a journey. Oh, we are traveling. And oh, it is hard work and it is difficult. Are you straining yourself? But the final piece of practical advice that we get is how can we press on in our faith? Well, we get it from verse 14. I press on towards the goal for the prize, the upward call of God. I don't think in our Christian lives we should settle for, mi for middle of the road. I don't think we should settle in our Christian lives. I think we need to be very careful not to be lukewarm as believers. We need to be running to him. We need to be putting in the effort and the work and there is nothing that motivates us more than this idea. My third point is pressing towards the goal. You think, oh, it's so hard to read my Bible. It's so hard to be a Christian in my workplace, in my environment, in my family. It is so hard. It's so much work. It's so much effort. There's so many difficulties and hardships that are standing in my way. Is it worth it? Is it worth pursuing God with every fibre of my being, with everything I've got? Is it worth it? Well, I have to be honest, I have never seen an athlete coming up to the finishing line and say, you know what, I'm going to take it easy. I can see the finishing line. I can see where I'm going. I'm going to take it a little bit slow. Athletes conserve their energy so that when they see the finishing line is nearing, they give everything they've got. I wonder, are we in our Christian life crawling towards the finish line or are we straining after it? Are we pressing on?
And friends, I, I want to say this in, in love and, uh, and hopefully some tenderness. But as we are thinking about our Christian lives, as we are thinking about where we are going, the reality is that for some of us in this room, we might be nearing the finish line. I don't know how long left you've got of this race. Ten years? Five years? A year? I don't know when you will cross that finish line. I don't know when the end is coming. But the one thing I know this, even though your bodies might be slowing down, don't let your spiritual walk slow down. Don't let your heart go cold. May you ever be on fire for him. Him who bought you. Him who loved you. Him who died for you. Him who will forgive your past. Are you on fire for him? Are you straining towards him? Are you pressing towards that goal? Because eventually the finishing line will come. And it's a a beautiful reminder That through everything you've been through in your life, God has kept you. Through everything in your life, God has kept his promises. And I love that hymn, and we we sang it last week, When Peace Like a River. And we sang that line, didn't we? The sky, not the grave, is my goal. As you are running this race, Christian, as you are nearing the finishing line, remember this, that it is only the Christian who has victory in death. Why? Because we have victory in Jesus' death and in his resurrection. And I want to urge you, if the finishing line is almost in sight, we're not going to slow down, are we? In our prayer life, in our reading of scripture, in our praise or magnitude to God, oh, might it continue to the end. Might we be filled with the Spirit continually glorying in him. And life can be really hard and it can be difficult. But saints, I want to encourage you, despite the hardship and difficulty of life, be encouraged because heaven is near. We're close. I consider myself to be young. Regardless what anyone says, I am young. And so what? Maybe 40, 50 years I might have left if I'm lucky? Compared to eternity, it's not that long. When I think of how fast the race of life is compared to the glories of forever in eternity, this is hardly a marathon at all, is it? It is a reminder that in the grand scheme of everything, there will be nothing that compares to the goal, to the prize. Have you heard the the phrase, keep your eye on the prize? Well, I I think that's a true statement for Christians. Keep your eye on the prize. As we are nearing the finish line, whatever stage of life we are in, many of us do not know the future. We don't know what's around the corner, but I know this. For all who are trusting in Jesus, heaven awaits. Glory awaits. The sky, not the grave, is my goal. Do not for one moment take your eyes off where you are going, of where your destination is. Perhaps one of the reasons that we struggle in our Christian life is because we spend so much time looking backwards at the past, We spend so much time worrying about the present and not enough time thinking about the finishing line. I think as Christians, we need to live with eternity in mind. The past might be difficult. The present might be difficult. But where are we going to? What is our final place? What is our prize? What is our goal? Why is it worth following Jesus above everything else. What is this prize? What is this upward call? Well, many commentators have speculated that this great joy is heaven. 
to be welcomed in to heaven. And I certainly think there's a lot of truth to that. But I almost think that saying that the prize is heaven almost sells it short of what the actual glory is. You must remember that this is the upward call of Christ Jesus. Heaven will be beautiful, heaven will be glorious, but specifically, what a Christian will one day attain is Christ himself. What's the one thing better than heaven? Jesus. I will one day see my Saviour. I will one day worship my Saviour. I will one day be in the presence of his glory. That's my prize. Christ himself. To be with the one who has made me his own. It's worth pressing on. It's worth keeping on in our spiritual lives. I love the, uh, the hymn, When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. For me, that is the great prize that we are running. And we are not yet at the finishing line. We, we, we don't know how far we are, but we're further back. But the reminder is, do not look to the past, do not look to the present. Look and remember, one day I'll see him. And one millisecond, not that there will be time in heaven, but you know what I mean. One glimpse of my Saviour, one glimpse of Jesus Christ, and all the pain and stress and worries will melt away. It will all be worth it when I reach the finishing line. All of the, the straining, all of the reaching, all of the pressing, all of it worth it when I see my Jesus. I have never seen an athlete stand on the podium with all the cameras and all the cheering being presented with a gold medal. I've never seen an athlete go, it's a bit small, this gold medal, isn't it? I thought it'd be a bit bigger. Is this it? Is this what I've worked all my days for? Is this what I've dedicated my life to? Is, is this it? Every time an athlete receives a gold medal, it is the best moment of their life. How much greater will it be when we finally attain the resurrection? How great will it be when we finally claim the prize, the upward call? whether he returns or whether we uh, die, whatever means in which we meet him, for all who are trusting in Jesus, I'm going to see him. I will see the one who made me his own. Do you believe that this morning? Amen.